Good day, everyone. This is uh, Chris with the Ancient Scholar, and today I'd like to uh, do a short discussion uh, based on a question that was asked of me by a friend who apparently is doing a flight orientation and um, was presented with somewhat of a dilemma or something that he, he didn't quite understand. Uh, so hopefully I can clear that question up uh, for him and maybe other people that um, have come across this dilemma. And the question was presented to me like this. Uh, hey, uh, Chris, uh, how does denitrogenation cause uh, the FRC or the functional residual capacity to decrease? Well, uh, first I had to identify exactly what was meant by, um, or actually the, the, the specific terminology it was used it was a quote-unquote nitrogen washout. And I, at first I had to identify what exactly we were talking about in regards to nitrogen washout. Uh, as you know, there are the um, nitrogen uh, breath tests that are used in um, pulmonary function testing, uh, and that actually is one of the ways that we are able to measure uh, indirectly um, uh, some of these these capacities and volumes that um, can't be um, directly measured, such as the functional residual capacity, the residual volume, etc. And there is another type of nitrogen washout that is often talked about in um, airway management. And basically, the thinking is with uh, a nitrogen washout, denitrogenation, or preoxygenation, all three terms are synonymous in this context. Um, that uh, what we do is we have a patient um, inhale a uh, very high FiO2, preferably 100% or uh, FiO2 of 1. Uh, for several minutes prior to intubation. What does this do? Well, this washes the nitrogen out of the lungs. Um, the typical atmosphere we breathe is about 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. Um, we wash that nitrogen out, replace it with oxygen. I have much more oxygen in my lungs, and that gives me somewhat of a reserve during um, airway management um, or airway manipulation procedures, particularly uh, in rapid sequence intubation and anesthesia induction, where I am, um, I have an apneic patient, and I'm, I'm intubating them. Um, that you know allows that, that increases the amount of oxygen in the lungs and kind of gives me a reserve, and it can be important, particularly in um, um, critically ill, moribund patients, pediatric patients, and um, even uh, very obese patients. Uh, this can be helpful. Uh, so that's a little bit of context as to what we're talking about. So let's go ahead and dive into this question. And the question is, does preoxygenation uh, decrease functional residual capacity? Uh, there is some literature out there you can look at uh, about uh, denitrogenation, denitrogenizing, um, washing out nitrogen, and, and it does in fact appear that it, theoretically and in some cases it may cause a decrease in the functional residual capacity. Um, uh, particularly um, a phenomenon known as absorption atelectasis. Now, atelectasis is collapse of al is alveolar collapse. If the alveoli are collapsing, that decreases the amount of volume available in the lungs, and of course, that's going to decrease the functional residual capacity. Um, so let's talk about how this can happen. Now, am I going to? Am I saying that this is? Uh, potentially dangerous in every patient or uh, a particularly cons particularly valid concern in every patient that gets preoxidated? No, but it is at least a, a theoretical and potentially valid concern in certain patients. So the way this works, again, we go back to, uh, let's talk about the chemistry of the two major gases in the atmosphere, nitrogen and oxygen. Okay, uh, If we look at nitrogen, nitrogen is a... Um, is a compared to oxygen is a rather large atom. Um, it has a, an atomic radius of about 57 picometers or picometers uh, compared to oxygen, which has a atomic radius of about 48 uh, picometers. Okay, so there's a little difference. And of course, uh, nitrogen, as we know it, exists as a, a diatomic gas, uh, the oxygen molecule, or N2, and oxygen, of course, exists as a diatomic gas. Um, with that said, nitrogen, the nitrogen molecule, the diatomic nitrogen, is going to uh, have a, be larger. It's going to be a larger molecule. It's going to take up more space than oxygen. And in under normal circumstances, when I'm breathing, I have much more nitrogen in my lungs than oxygen. Well, let's think about what happens uh, under normal conditions when I breathe. I inhale, 
and uh, my lungs full, mainly of nitrogen, a little bit of oxygen. In most cases, the oxygen um, is going to diffuse out of the lungs, and it's going to diffuse along with a gradient. It's going to want to go into the blood, and it'll leave the alveoli. Um, however, the good thing is we have all this nitrogen, which for the most part stays in the alveoli. Obviously, we have a certain amount of nitrogen um, dissolved in our blood um, as, a, as a gas, uh, but for the most part, the nitrogen stays in the alveoli. So I inhale, the alveoli fills up with gas, there's oxygen and uh, nitrogen in there. The oxygen leaves, but the nitrogen is left, is, is left in there, and it keeps the alveoli open. It prevents the alveoli from collapsing. Fair enough. Intuitively, that makes sense. Now here's, theoretically, where we can run into problems is when I get rid of all that nitrogen, I breathe 100% oxygen, uh, I get rid of all that nitrogen, and then I have somebody who's maybe um, moribund, or, or maybe they're, they're critically ill, and they are you know, using a lot of oxygen. I, you know, I don't have that nitrogen in there. The oxygen um, diffuses out of the alveoli along with its gradient. I no longer have nitrogen in there, you know, a big fluffy mo molecule if you want to look at it that way, to um, exert a pressure to help keep the alveoli open and um, the alveoli are then at risk for collapsing because um, I don't have that nitrogen available to occupy some of that space. Um, so I just drew a couple of real crude pictures here just to give you a visual representation here. I have nitrogen, a relatively larger atomic radii, radius uh, than oxygen, and just kind of a not to scale comparison of look, the nitrogen's a bigger molecule than oxygen. Um, and then this picture, again, cut rather crude, but I, here's a normal alveolus filled with um, oxygen and nitrogen, about 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. Oxygen is going to diffuse with its gradient, but the nitrogen um, is left to exert a pressure and uh, occupy space and keep the alveolus or the alveoli, because you're going to have lots of these, um, open. However, in the case of um, nitrogen washout here, I've lost the nitrogen and all I have is oxygen, and as the oxygen diffuses out, because it's you know it's metabolically used, um, the alveoli is potentially at risk for um, collapsing, and of course that creates atelectasis. And if the atelectasis um, is significant enough, that can impact the functional residual capacity. Um, and we do see there's a lot of literature out there that does in fact say, hey, look, people that have surgical procedures come out of surgery, and they do tend to have a, dec a, a reduction and their functional residual capacities um, you know, due to anesthesia. Now, uh, I think it'd be a bit myopic to say that this is due entirely to absorption atelectasis. Uh, there are you know, lots of factors involved with, with anesthesia. You, you have a patient that's you know, laying down or they're, they're in a certain position, they're, they're not moving for an extended amount of time during surgery, um, that they're breathing inhaled anesthetic gases. Um, maybe they have uh, some other conditions. Um, you know, there are a lot of factors that we have to consider other than just absorption atelectasis in these patients, and that's really what I want to emphasize is that, um, you know, these uh, patients that develop massive atelectasis following surgery, uh, you know, generally they have lots of other issues, underlying pulmonary issues, underlying cardiac issues, underlying uh, medical issues. Um, so I think it would be a bit myopic to say that it's 100% due to us pre-oxygenating patients because that's certainly not the case, and that should be one of the major take-home points from this uh, uh, conversation. Uh, and this is also why we do things a, a lot of times uh, prior to surgeries. In a lot of cases, we will do pulmonary function tests on patients, particularly patients that are potentially at risk. And we do a pulmonary function test. We do... Um, uh, incentive spirometry, preferably we do incentive spirometry prior to the patient going into surgery, and then um, incentive spirometry uh, following surgery, and we try to get them back up to the baseline, and, and due to many factors, generally patients ha aren't, aren't going to have as, as large of volumes coming out of surgery, particularly if I'm doing abdominal and thoracic surgeries, you know, because now you have inflammation, you have potential um, damage and penetration of the structures involved in resp uh, the respiratory system, and you you have pain. You know, just pain alone um, can cause patients not to want to take you know good deep breaths. So, 
again, a plethora of issues that you need to consider and not simply zero in on one thing. And um, unfortunately, sometimes in healthcare, and, and I see this a lot in EMS, because I you know, happen to work in EMS, we try to oversimplify issues and say, okay, it's absorption atelectasis, the physiology makes sense, okay, that's what it is. And we need to, we just need to be aware that, look, there's a much bigger picture out there. Um, and um, I would say that this absorption atelectasis problem, um, I would not be as concerned as a paramedic if I'm on the street and I pre-oxygenate a patient prior to ventilate, uh, prior to intubating them. Um, I'm not sure that that's as big a concern as now the patient's in the hospital, I'm having issues oxygenating them, and they are on high FiO2s, and they've been on high FiO2s for you know several hours to several days. Then I would be more concerned about you know the effects of oxygen toxicity, absorption, electasis, and then whatever uh, whatever issues are associated with their underlying conditions. So uh, that's just my take on the issue, guys. Hopefully you found this uh, video interesting and helpful. And as always, thanks for hanging in there.